morning. Um, thank you for such great opening talks this morning. I think you, you really did set the stage for uh, some of the things that I'll be talking about. Um, I'm really excited to talk about this question. Whose job is it to practice service design in a product company? More and more, we service-minded designers are finding ourselves working in-house, working on products with people who don't necessarily think about it as a service yet. And so I'm interested in kind of getting into this this morning. How do we start to think about ourselves and the jobs that we do when the boundaries aren't necessarily clear and the role definitions might be a little fuzzy because you work with a lot of people who have similar responsibilities. And so today I'm going to share some of my own learnings um, in three acts. First act, why can't we be friends? As a young designer, which I'll admit I'm still fairly young, um, but earlier in my days, I thought that becoming a great designer meant getting really sharp with my design skills, uh, coming up with a brilliant idea, and then persuading everyone to get on board with what I was thinking because they'll come around and see it the way that I do. But what I was really doing with that attitude was setting up an us versus them game. Basically, design versus everyone else, product, tech, business. And I can remember plenty of frustrated sessions in my boss's office, rolling my eyes about the ridiculous request from our business owner to change the text on the button or from our engineers to just make the flow simpler because it would be easier for us to build. Don't they get it? It's about people. It's about users. Am I the only one who sees that? Fortunately, my views have changed over the years, mostly fueled by my experiences working inside of large organizations with a lot of different people. In my past role as design director at American Express, I led a team of designers working on financial services. We had so many stakeholders. Finance, legal, tech, product, risk, fraud, you name it. Everyone was involved. And one of the things that we did really well was that we used service design to try to bring everyone together. We developed a fairly straightforward process, starting with immersion, really going deep and learning about the problem moving into a service jam where we could bring all of our stakeholders together and come up with new ideas, and then finishing with concept development, taking a few of those ideas and really bringing them to life. One of my favorite projects was this one, where we were asked to reimagine the future of direct deposit. Now, here in the EU, it's extremely easy to get your paycheck into your bank account. It's pretty much obvious, right? Um, but in the United States, it's a very difficult process. You actually have to fill out a form, and there's some steps that you have to take. Um, and it can be quite opaque to people who aren't familiar with financial services. And so we started by talking to our customers about their finances and their jobs. And then we took our insights from the research and got everyone together to come up with dozens of new concepts. We ended up pursuing a couple of those concepts and building them out into these nice, very high fidelity uh, customer journeys. And it was great. Everyone came together, everybody was on board with the ideas, and service design was a success. And here's what I learned. We all want the same thing. When we're working in-house at a company together, we're all there to try to create a great user experience. But between designers and everyone else, we might think about getting there in different ways. This brings me to act two, ch ch changes. <laughs> in January of this year, I joined the design team at Spotify. We're about 60 designers that operate out of about eight different offices around the world, across different time zones. And we're all working within our own development teams. So what that means is that as a designer, I sit with my own development team, which we call squads at Spotify, and everyone is responsible for a particular piece of the customer journey. It's great. I'm empowered to make all the decisions that I need to make within my squad. Works really well. 
So I was excited to join this team, start a new job. I moved to Stockholm in January. It was negative 15 when I got off the plane. But I was excited to join a company that I was so proud to represent. And I work in our revenue mission. What that means is that we're focused on our Spotify premium experience. And my squad specifically works on our payments platform that allows our customers in 60 countries around the world to pay for their Spotify premium subscription. We aim to make it as easy and convenient as possible for everyone to purchase Spotify. We even accept cash in Indonesia, which is an interesting service design problem. And when I started working with the team, one of the first things that I did was understood our process. Everybody at Spotify uses the same process. Think it, build it, ship it, tweak it. So we'll start with a seed of an idea, do a brainstorm, come up with a lot of concepts, and then build one or two of them that we can ship to our users. And then as we learn about how they use it, uh, we can tweak it, making adjustments until we take something that we thought was good and make it great. Our process is unique to us, but you might recognize some of the themes of iteration and learning from the lean startup method, build, measure, learn. Same ideas. What our process does really well is that it allows us to iterate exactly that. It allows us to take something that starts out as OK and turn it into something that we think is really successful. It allows us to experiment a lot because we're constantly building and shipping and coming up with new things. But as designers, this can pose some challenges. I mean, we're designers. We're really excited to build new stuff, right? That's what we do. But it holds us back sometimes from being able to think broadly and strategically about the spaces in between the things that we're building. We don't have a lot of time left to think about the connection tissue in our experiences. And with all of us in our own squads, responsible for our own pieces of the journey, it can be difficult to see across the entire experience. So, of course, I'm standing on stage at a service design conference. I thought, yes, service design is going to be the way to solve this. But I have bad news. Service design is not magic. Uh, you may think that it is, but it's not. Um, and so when I, when I started you know, touting service design at Spotify, of course, everybody was really excited about it as an idea. Like, yes, we want that. This sounds like a great idea. But it's really difficult in practice to get product-minded people to shift the way that they're thinking and the way that they're working. This was one of my first projects at Spotify. Um, I thought it would be really great to do a service blueprint, get everybody in a room, put stuff up on the walls, and I, I invited a bunch of people to come and like cut things out with me um, right on the whiteboard, and I thought it would be really awesome to do it together. Everybody could, could learn along the way. Um, and again, everyone was very excited to do this, but I ended up working on this alone in a room by myself. While I was thinking strategically, everyone else was busy shipping. And I learned very quickly that when you're working inside of a fast-paced product organization, it's really expensive to take a team for weeks or months to do a service design project. I would even say that it's anti-agile. It's definitely anti-lean. And it's true. Even if we did use service design methods to come up with a great solution, our needs will have changed by the time we get there. This brings me to act three, which is really the meat of what I'm gonna talk about today, coming together. Remember, we all want the same thing. We wanna make a great user experience. But service design and agile or lean or whatever method your product team is using have totally different ways of working and they actually have different goals in mind in how they operate as processes. And so my proposal is to shift how we're using service design so that it fits into how your fast-moving product team is already working. I believe that if we can do this, 
we can still get the benefits of service design. We can deliver a consistent user experience. We can build empathy with our users. We can get stakeholders invested in design. But we can also add on the benefits of lean or agile, being able to experiment and learn quickly from those experiments that we run. And so I'd like to talk about three strategies that I've used in my work to start to shift the way that we're using service design. Building relationships, making things together, and throwing away your artifacts. First, building relationships. This is really the fabric of service design when you're working in-house. One thing I think we can all do very easily is to start to shift our terminology. In design, we often talk about our stakeholders as the people who are impacted by the work that we're doing. But of course, when you're in-house, these people are on the same payroll as you. They are impacted by the work you're doing, but so are you. So we can shift to calling them partners and treating them like partners. And as in any good partnership, it's important to start to learn about them. What do they do for fun on the weekends? What motivates them to come to work every day? And what keeps them up at night worrying? When I joined the team, I started meeting a lot of people. With all of our designers being all around the world, I thought it would be really important to get to know them. I met a lot of designers, but I also met just a lot of people. I wanted to know what our business owners were up to and our partnership teams. I even joined our customer service team's Friday afternoon music quiz, which admittedly has nothing to do with user experience, but I thought it couldn't hurt to get to know the customer service team and see how they think about users. I also picked up a lot of obscure 90s music trivia, which will help me some, at some point in my career, I'm sure. But really, it's all about this. Drop the idea that you need to have a formal service design practice to be able to practice service design. Just do it. Start talking to people. Do it over coffee or beers or lunch, whatever works. But alone, just talking to each other about the work that you're doing can start to bridge those gaps between the silos in your organization. Next up, making things together. So now that you've found these people that you're working with and found your allies, um, start making things. When I'm working with a new partner who isn't totally familiar with service design, my go-to is the usual <laughs> journey mapping. It's tangible, everybody can participate, and it's based on a story. It's really easy for newcomers to understand how to do it. This was one of my favorite journey maps that we did at American Express very low fidelity. One of our designers got in a room and started putting post-its on the board, and then we pulled in all of our partners to help us build out the journey map. So we did this together. And what it did for us was established a working group right away. We were able to start having important questions, and we had the people in the room who needed to be there to answer them. And this journey map became the North Star for the whole project. So as we went on, even though everybody was working on their individual components, everybody had the same goal in mind, and it really served to, to unify the team and make them invested in the experience that we are trying to create. So when you're working with new folks, try to focus on these tangible and participatory activities, things like journey mapping, storyboards, and maybe a service safari. Those things are really easy for newcomers to get on board with. Some of these more advanced activities, like service blueprinting or task analyses, even mental models, they're a bit more abstract and complex. And while they're really important for us as service designers, they can be more difficult for newcomers to understand how to participate. But use small projects to start to build that service awareness in your product-minded partners. And over time, you'll find that these small projects add up and you can build an alliance who's going to support your work because they will have participated in getting there. Finally, throw away your artifacts. When you're in-house, you don't always have time to make things high fidelity. And in fact, you're going to be working a lot in low fidelity because that's how you get other people on board. 
not about having something polished at the end of the day, it's about taking your artifacts to just enough fidelity to move the work forward. Recently, we started a project at Spotify to look at our payment flows and really understand what's happening there. This was our brief. <laughs> we think there's a problem here, but we don't exactly know what it is or why it's happening. Does that sound familiar to anyone here? And so I started small. I grabbed one of our POs, got into a room, and started hashing out the foundations for what could be a service blueprint. This took us about 45 minutes. Another 15 minutes later, we put it into a spreadsheet as our first draft. And 15 minutes after that, we had it printed out and put up on the wall in our, in our office. This immediately changed the conversations that we were having about that problem. Where we started very fuzzy, you know, we think there's a problem, now we could point to the holes that we could all see in the user experience. And this activity alone generated a lot of insights for us quickly. Our data team had been working on some new dashboards for our metrics, and they were able to take some of these learnings right away into their work. And the most important coup for me as a designer was that seeing all this up on the wall showed everyone how important it is for us to do more qualitative research with our users, because we had a lot of unanswered questions. So what did we do from here? Remember this process that I showed you? I want to highlight step three. We really like to build things at Spotify. And everything we do is in service of getting things out the door. And so we moved on. We took our blueprint and used it to create some customer journey slash storyboards um, to start to tell a more detailed story about the users that we are working with. And these now are serving as a map for us to see where we should be focusing our prototyping and building efforts. There is real value in getting things up on the wall quickly, but be nimble. Bring your artifacts to just enough fidelity to move the conversation forward and then move on. So again, these are three strategies that I've used successfully. It all starts with building relationships. This alone can help to build a service alliance in your organization. Making things together, get your partners involved. Get them invested in the work that you're doing. Bring them along on the journey. Show them how easy it is to start. And throw away your artifacts. Take them to just enough fidelity to keep things moving, and then move on. Now, before I close, I do want to return to my original question. Whose job is it? My answer is that it's complicated. As designers, it's our responsibility to bring our expertise, to activate and engage our partners, and to make sure that the service design activities that we need to do can fit into the cadence of the work that's already being done. And for our partners, it's their responsibility to be involved, to join us, to participate, and to start to develop their own service awareness that they can bring into every project. I truly believe that if we are all working toward a great user experience and we're working together, it becomes everybody's job, everybody's responsibility. Thank you. <laughs>